It's right here, isn't it? Be fun. Well, no, how does the light up here? It's a little annoying. Yes, but you know. Cindy, this isn't bad. You want to try it? Come here. Better. Better.
Good evening. Um, my name is Philip Berg, and on behalf of the Board of Student Advisors and Dean Clark's office, I'd like to welcome everyone to the 79th Annual Ames Moot Court Final Round Competition. Um, tonight's case, Wilson v. Barnes, was developed by Professor Lawrence Tribe, and it involves a dispute between the legislative and executive branches over the pocket veto clause of the Constitution. Um, rep um, presiding at tonight's case this evening as Chief Justice will be um, Judge Cynthia Holcomb Hall of the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. As Associate Justices will be um, the Honorable Kenneth Starr, um, Solicitor General of the United States, and Judge Frank Easterbrook of the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. I'm arguing on behalf of the petitioner, the pocket protectors, will be Stephen Parkinson and Rhoda Weeks. And arguing on behalf of the respondents, the Woody Guth Guthrie team, will be Michael Best and Cynthia Monaco. Um, a few announcements. Um, for those who would like to take photographs um, during the argument, please take all of your photographs before the first oralist begins. And, and when the first oralist begins, please refrain from taking any photographs. And please hold all applause until all of the um, oralists have have completed their arguments and the judges have been dismissed from the chambers. And lastly, the Board of Student Advisors would like to invite everybody to a reception that will be held in the John Chipman Gray Room on the second floor of Pound Hall immediately following the argument. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, we're here to hear argument in the case of Wilson versus Barnes. Petitioners? Please the court. I am Stephen Parkinson, counsel for the petitioners. I will briefly state the key facts in this case and address why the respondent should be denied standing. Co-counsel Rhoda Weeks will explain why the president's exercise of his pocket veto power was valid. On November 18, 1983, Congress presented H.R. 4042 to the president, ended its first session, and adjourned for 67 days. President Reagan subsequently pocket vetoed the bill. While Congress was still adjourned and before any attempt to reenact the measure, 33 members of the House of Representatives filed this suit seeking to compel the publication of H.R. 4042 as law despite the President's pocket veto. The Senate, the Speaker of the House, and the House leadership intervened as plaintiffs. Respondents alleged that the President's pocket veto was invalid because the House had appointed an agent to receive messages. 
They seek a declaratory judgment that H.R. 4042 became law and writs of mandamus, compelling the executive clerk of the White House to deliver the bill to the archivist of the United States and the archivist to publish the bill as law. The court should deny these plaintiffs standings for, the court should deny these congressmen standing to sue the executive branch for three interrelated reasons. First, granting these members of Congress standing in order to resolve a power dispute between the two branches of government would violate the separation of powers principle, which lies at the heart of Article III standing. Secondly, congressmen do not exercise legislative power as a personal prerogative, but as representatives of the people. Therefore, respondents have suffered no personal injury. And third, the court should only be used as a last resort. And here, the respondents seek to use the judiciary as a first resort, despite the existence of adequate political remedies. First. Let me ask you, counsel, sure. you raised the question of whether the congressmen have a personal prerogative. Um, haven't your opponents dropped that issue? Uh, no, Your Honor. If, if, in fact, our opponents dropped the issue that, that they'd suffered a personal injury, um, then the case would be over. No, they're taking the position that the only person who is here and has standing is, is Congress itself, not the individuals. Mm -hmm. that's, that's correct, Your Honor. The issue is whether or not Congress has a personal interest in the representative powers which it exercises. And we may say that that is not a personal right. interest. Uh, turning first to the general separation of powers concerns. Separation of power concerns are raised in this case in two ways. First, you are asked, the court is being asked to take action which will effectively nullify an executive act. Secondly, the court is being asked to hear a case being brought by congressmen in order to obtain a political objective that they seek in the legislative Wait, process. Wait, I think you're switching back to congressmen rather than Congress itself as an institution. Right. The fundamental but the, different consequences do flow in, in the analysis, don't you think, if we're talking about Congress as an institution seeking to assert standing as opposed to individual members who can obviously go back to Congress and say, I want to win here. I think you're now saying Congress is here having said, we have done everything that we can. You may not agree with that, but I think that's the position we're, we're hearing on the other side. Right. And the, the, I guess the question is whether or not when a congressman's uh, vote is diminished or, a con or something happens in which uh, the political process does not work the way a congressman wants it to, whether that is really an injury which inures to, that, to the Congress, to the, to the Congress itself, or whether it's an injury that inures to the, represent to the constituents which the congressperson represents. And what we maintain today is that it's not Constitution, it's not the Congress itself which has an interest in uh, the proper working of the legislative process. The, the people who have an interest in the proper working of the legislative process are the constituents but who the Congress stand represents. Would they, as a general matter, a constituent who is not directly affected uh, would not have standing, I think, under your theory? They would have standing if uh, the measure in question caused a concrete injury. And to give you an example of such a case would be the pocket veto case itself, where the Okanagan Indian tribe received certain rights property rights under the legislation which the president pocket vetoed. And one, because they couldn't... One can imagine that, but do you think that accurately describes the facts of this statute? Is there anyone who would have standing if Congress does not? We would argue... I, 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 mean, I could imagine a hypothetical situation in which somebody might be entitled to certain uh, payments under the statute or something of that nature, and because the statute wasn't passed, this, they wouldn't get the... This statute? Well, under this statute, it would be difficult, I would, gr I would concede, to imagine a private plaintiff. Well, then, then let's consider the question. Is it your position that when Congress passes statutes affecting foreign affairs, the president can do what he wishes? He can pocket veto the statute or ignore the statute, and no one, not a resident of the United States, not a member of Congress, can ever challenge it? Um, yes, Your Honor. First of all, just two points to make on that. The first is that if there is nobody in the United States who is able to, who has suffered any concrete personal injury because of the statute, uh, under the uh, holdings in United States v. Richardson 
and Schlesinger, where you have just a generalized grievance in which no one is injured, um, it would be reasonable for the court to defer because the court, under the separation of powers principle, doesn't want to intervene why, until why it absolutely you, has why to. Why do you call this deference as opposed to abdication? You see, as I understand right. your argument, your argument is that there is no standing because of principles of separation of powers, of concern for the right allocation between branches. And yet what you seem to be saying is that whenever there is a dispute between Congress and the President, the President always wins. That's incorrect, Your Honor. And the reason that's incorrect is because under our system of government, in which there's checks and balances, each branch of government has been given powers through which it can protect its interests. The framers were very aware of the fact that the different branches might, may try to usurp the power of the other branches. And to protect against that, they gave each branch political remedies, which it could use to protect itself from the other branches. And what we're arguing to the court today is that those protections which Congress has been granted to protect itself, um, ranging from control over uh, the budget to appointment powers to ultimately, in the absolute last resort, impeachment, and a whole range of different powers they have in the dynamic complex uh, political system which we live in, that those are adequate. And therefore, because of the separation of powers, concerns that are raised by allowing the court to hear a case which directly involves a political power, power dispute between the two branches, given the fact that such significant separation of power concerns are raised, and the fact that the Congress has remedies available to it to protect itself from such but things. Is this necessarily a political problem? Uh, we have here a, a request for an interpretation of the Constitution. Isn't that the, exactly the sort of thing that courts are set to do, and which, um, uh, in the case of an impasse, and one side being represented by the Congress, not the individuals, and the other side by the executive, it would be appropriate to bring it to a court. It is the role of the courts to interpret the Constitution and the laws, and we don't question that. What we are arguing is that standing, but, it, but standing doctrine is a limitation on the court's exercise of that power. The court has never held that simple, the fact that somebody appears before the court alleging a constitutional violation is sufficient for the court to review that matter. That's why the court does not allow advisory held, judgments. But has it ever held that the availability of your own remedies means there is no standing? I have in mind particularly a case like United States against Nixon, where Nixon, the president, and the United States are litigating, although it's perfectly clear Nixon had his own remedies. He could have fired the special prosecutor again, and he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Why, why couldn't one have said the same thing about the existence of a case or controversy in the Nixon case? Uh, in the Nixon case, first of all, you, you're dealing in a criminal capacity, which is a different situation. And when Nixon, and you're asking whether or not Nixon has certain rights once he's already in a, a judicial setting, which unfortunately he was unable to avoid. Um, but he could have avoided it. He could have fired the special prosecutor. That's all he had to do. Right. Well, we would argue again, once you're in, in a criminal setting, the situation is um, much different. All right, well, I'll take away the criminal setting mm -hmm. and make it the wonderful case of United States against Interstate Commerce Commission, mm -hmm. where there is litigation between parts of the executive branch. And the court has adjudicated such cases with an executive agency on each side. Couldn't, it, again, one say the same kind of thing in those cases? Uh, yes, it would be slightly different, first because um, when you're dealing with the three branches of government and they have powers to protect themselves, that is not the exact same situation where we have two uh, parts of the executive branch uh, which, facing off each other. Which way does it cut? Isn't it easier to say, you guys in the executive branch settle your own disputes and we'll adjudicate the ones that can't be settled so easily? I mean, wouldn't that be a sensible line? It seems to me the distinction cuts against you rather than for you. I think the sensible line, given the separation of powers, concerns is to refrain from adjudication um, of matters involving strictly political power uh, unless there's been an injury that's in some concrete personal way. Um, and such an injury would be to a citizen either in his personal capacity or to somebody, a congressman or congresswoman who has suffered uh, an injury to the emoluments of his or her office. Well, it is curious that, and I'm trying to understand the basis for your approach, that no matter how trifling the injury to a specific individual, 
that is enough to establish standing, and yet a very, perhaps a grave injury inflicted on Congress as an institution must go unredressed unless it avails itself of what you see as a sufficient group of, of other remedies, but they're rather clumsy remedies. The I advantage of a, of a court proceeding is that the Congress comes in and says, here is our position under the law, and we think that that is correct, and that's what the judiciary's province is. I would disagree that they are clumsy remedies. I think Congress can very effectively uh, redress the concerns that it has. In this case, specifically, the redress which they seek is uh, to have H.R. 4042 enacted into law. Let's assume that you're wrong, that the remedies are clumsy. Accept that for purposes of the argument. Why is institutional damage not sufficient to establish standing if an identifiable trifle to one individual is enough to establish standing? The reason, again, goes back to the separation of powers principle. And the desire in sta in sta through standing doctrine not to allow the court to become a forum in which majoritarian conflicts are settled between two branches of government over issues of political power, but instead to limit the courts to a role in which they are vindicating personal rights and personal injuries. And to the extent in order to vindicate those injuries, they have to address power struggles uh, within the, between the executive and the legislative branch, then it's proper for it to do so. But this, the basic idea is that standing doctrine should be interpreted in a way to minimize judicial involvement in the legislative process. And what we're arguing here is that the best way to do that is first to remit Congress to the constitutional powers it has been given to protect its interests. And in this case, they were, in fact, able to pass a, um, sub, uh, a measure which overlapped in a lot of ways, uh, PL 98 332 required President Reagan to certify human rights improvements in um, El Salvador. And, and secondly, in the case of Kennedy v. Jones, is another example where there was a suit brought and a measure was pocket vetoed, and the exact same bill was able to be passed. Now, the check on this system, so that the court has not, does not completely abdicate from settling these disputes, is when a, some individual in the United States is hurt in a concrete, personal way like the Okanagan Indian tribe in the pocket veto case. That's when it's the appropriate juncture for the court to step in and to adjudicate the case. Essentially, it's a balancing act which, which we're asking the court to perform, which is to allow Congress to exhaust its remedies and to keep Congress focused on its primary function, which is the exercise of political power uh, in the democratic process, and only to come before this court uh, and hear these type of claims when there's a personal injury, that that's the best balance of the competing interests that the court faces today. Again, I just uh, want to make one other clarification just in the general doctrinal history of, of, of standing. Um, and specifically, I want to go to Coleman v. Miller, which is an early case um, in which standing was granted to state senators based on um, uh, an, an alleged injury to their uh, voting power. And there's two key distinctions in that case, and I think that's the case which has created a lot of the controversy which has uh, led to this case today. The first is that the separation of powers principle we're concerned about was not central in that case because they were state legislators bringing the case and not uh, legislators, United States legislators who have these checks which we've described today. Uh, the second distinction that is important is that the early interpretation of standing doctrine focused on concrete adverseness between the parties. Um, and that kind of philosophy was summarized in Baker v. Carr. And the point there was you just wanted to have people that truly were injured so that they could uh, zealously advocate their positions. But the court has, since that time, recognized the importance of separation of powers concerns. And because of that, they backed off from simply adjudicating cases when uh, they simply adjudicating cases when there is no personal injury which has been suffered. And we're, we're arguing that the court today should recognize the separation of powers uh, problems which are raised by this case and should therefore refrain from hearing it. Thank you. Uh, to conclude, just to wrap up uh, Your quickly. Your time is up. Oh, my time up is up. Well, thank you for the reasons that I've stated. Uh, please find that the respondents do not have standing. Very well. Thank you. We'll hear from your colleague.
May it please the court. I am Rhoda Weeks, co-counsel for the executive branch petitioners. The substantive issue in this case involves an interpretation of the pocket veto clause of Article 1, Section 7 of the Constitution, which provides that where Congress, by their adjournment, prevents the President from returning a bill to the originating House, the bill shall not be a law. I shall argue that even if this Court finds that the respondents have standing, this Court should nonetheless reverse the judgment of the Court of Appeals, because the President's pocket veto of H.R. 4042 was constitutionally valid, notwithstanding that the House of Representatives had appointed the Clerk of the House to receive messages from the President during an adjournment. This Court should require that bills be returned to the originating House itself and not to, to an agent for three reasons. First, use of such an agent goes against the clear holding of this Court's only precedent that governs the facts of this case. Second, use of such agents is at odds with the intent of the framers of the Constitution with regards to the pocket veto clause. And third, use of such agents introduce, um, is against public policy to the extent that it introduces undesirable and dangerous uncertainty into the legislative process. Turning first to precedent, in a unanimous decision, this court in the pocket veto case rejected use of an agent like the clerk of the house to receive bills um, during an intercession adjournment. The plaintiffs in the pocket veto case argued that the pocket veto clause only applies during final adjournments and that during the intercession adjournment there, the president should have returned the bill to some appropriate agent of Congress. I have just a factual question about the way in which this works, counsel. Yes. Who receives a return veto? Who receives when the House is in session? Or? Yes. Um, generally, it's presented, I believe, to an agent of the House who records it and makes notes. So it's presented to an agent even when the House is in session. But that well, is. I'm not sure I understand why you're saying it shouldn't be sent to an agent. Since it goes, even return vetoes go to agents. Exactly. The, the distinction in this case, Your Honor, is that when, when Congress is not in session, it's incapable of carrying out its duties as a Congress. The problem that we raise is not with the agent per se. It's with using an agent when Congress itself is not in session and is incapable of doing all of the other things that Article 1, Section 7 requires it to do upon receiving a return bill from the President. Um, Congress, by definition, works to pass legislation, and it can only do that when functioning as a collegial body um, in Washington. They cannot do that when they're adjourned and in their respective congressional districts, and that is the distinction in this case. Um, I think your colleagues are of the view that our discussion in pocket veto uh, is, is fairly characterized as, as dicta, and uh, um, they, of course, suggest that Wright has disclaimed the uh, importance of that particular discussion. That is correct, Your Honor. The respondents do argue that. However, that is incorrect. In fact, in the pocket veto case, the, um, the, this court had to, had to in, in, its, in rejecting the arguments of the plaintiffs, this court necessarily had to reject use of an agent. The plaintiffs in that case argued explicitly, that was their entire complaint, they argued that the president should have returned the bill to either the clerk of the House or the secretary of the Senate or some other appropriate agent. Those were the exact words. And this court unequivocally rejected that. This court held that um, return to such agents does not meet the constitutional mandate because the Constitution requires return to, quote, a House in session, unquote, a House capable of entering objections onto the journal and of reconsidering those objections. And you are right again that the respondents re rely on right v. U.S to support use of an agent, but we would urge that Wright is factually distinguishable from this case. In Wright, this court was faced with a unique situation in which um, on the 10th day after a bill had been presented to the president, the originating house was away for a three-day recess, but the non-originating house was still in session. The president could not have used a pocket veto because only one house and not the Congress had adjourned as required before the pocket veto clause is triggered. But the president could also not use his return veto because the originating house was not there. Faced with this dilemma in which the president was essentially precluded from participating in the legislative process, although he had done all he could, this court agreed or decided to give effect to the president's actual return of the bill 
to the Secretary of the Senate. But again, that was, a, that was a unique case. And even Wright itself recognized that the considerations would be different if the full Congress had adjourned, which is the case here. So the only precedent that really directly governs this case is the pocket veto. And in order for this court to recognize the validity of the clerk of the House here, it will have to overrule this decision in a pocket veto case. Putting, putting these questions about agents to one side, what do you see as the practical difference between a pocket veto and a return veto before the end of the entire Congress during one of these intercession breaks? The difference between the precedent used in one and the other? Between a pocket and a return veto. Um, let, me, let me tell you why I'm asking this question. Your, your colleague's argument on standing is essentially that Congress can protect itself from the President's pocket veto by taking up and repassing the law pretty much as if there had been a return veto. Now, suppose we are persuaded by that. Doesn't that also mean that there's no practical difference between return and pocket vetoes? That this, what you're trying to argue as an important presidential prerogative is, according to your own colleague, of no account. Makes no difference. Um, there, there is a significant difference, Your Honor. Um, as, as the Congress, as the respondents themselves recognize, and as sources that we quoted have recognized, it is far more difficult to reenact a pocket vetoed bill than to reenact one that has been uh, returned with the return veto. And in an effort, in Congress, in an effort to avoid having bills pocket vetoed, is going to adopt certain practices that we urge are good legislative practices and are in fact the reason why the pocket veto clause exists in the first place. But if, it, but if you say it's far more difficult to deal with a pocket vetoed bill than a return vetoed bill, mm -hmm. it seems to me to undercut the argument that there is no standing. Um, I'd, we would urge that it does not, Your Honor. The existence of political remedies um, is different than the, the, the ease with which those remedies can be obtained. The, the Constitution has set out, um, as my colleague argued, various checks and balances, and each, each, each branch has its own powers. The fact that those powers may not, in a particular climate, be as easy to pass, I mean, as easy to achieve as other times, um, does not go towards the fact that it do, in fact, exist. Indeed, we would argue that if a bill cannot be reenacted because it's been pocket vetoed, that's probably an indication that um, that Congress should not have passed it in the first place and that now they've realized the, what went wrong the first time and have in fact corrected it by not, not, re, not repassing it. Um, to go on to my next point, um, use, of, use of a congressional agent like the clerk of the House is also at odds with the intent of the framers of the Constitution. For the framers intended first that the pocket veto would be used as an affirmative power by the President and second, that it would motivate Congress to speedily reconsider or begin reconsideration of bills that had been returned by the President. In discerning the intent of the framers, um, it is two key facts about the pocket veto are relevant. First, the pocket veto was made an absolute veto by the framers, although they had rejected giving the President an absolute return veto. The absolute nature of the pocket veto can be contrasted with the return veto, which is only qualified to the extent that it can be overrated by a two-thirds vote of both houses of Congress. The second key fact is that there is very little legislative history available about the pocket veto clause. Therefore, this court can only infer why the framers made the pocket veto absolute rather than qualified. What we do know about the pocket veto clause is that the framers drafted it only after they had considered and rejected a first proposed provision that only gave the president a qualified veto. The framers would not have chosen an absolute, non-overridable veto over a qualified one without a very compelling reason. And yet neither the respondents nor the Court of Appeals have suggested any plausible explanation of the framers' actions. The most sensible explanation of why the framers chose an absolute pocket veto over the, the first qualified clause that they had is that they intended that the pocket veto would be used as an affirmative presidential power in the balance of powers between the executive and legislative Ms. branches. Ms. Weeks, let me ask you what you understand by prevent its return in the clause. Yes. It seems to me there are two different kinds of meanings it might have. One is a physical meaning, that there's nobody home 
to give the message to. The other is a political meaning, that Congress prevents its return by adjourning so thoroughly that this Congress will never be back. Now, you, you choose one of those, but, but why is it? Um, why it is it that you've chosen as you have? In interpreting the pocket veto clause, Your Honor, this court must interpret it in, in light of the rest of Article 1, Section 7, Clause 2. The first clause or the first sentence, or one of the first sentences in that clause, sets up the procedure by which bills should be returned to the president. Um, and, and the procedure involves, among other things, returning the bill, having it entered into the onto the journal of the originating house and having that house proceed to reconsider the bill. In the very last sentence of that clause, which is the pocket veto clause, the, the framers then said, unless Congress by their adjournment prevent its return, we urge that return as used in that last sentence is directly parallel to the return used in the first no, sentence. But I'm, but I'm asking about the meaning of prevent. And I'm, the question I'm, I'm trying to, to pursue is, wouldn't it be sensible to give prevent a political meaning? That is, this, is a, this clause is about political regulation of Congress and the President. Instead of asking whether there's somebody home, ask them whether they have adjourned in the kind of way that will prevent repassage. And that would mean end of session adjournment. And that, that, is, that is the political meaning of prevent. The kind of question I'm asking is, shouldn't we understand this clause as adjusting politics rather than about whether there's somebody home or whether there's a mailbox or whether there's an agent or any of those kinds of things? Um, we would urge that this clause, as, that the, the interpretation that we, urge, that we propose does in fact take into account a political meaning, but perhaps in a slightly different way than that urged by your honor. Because to the extent that it is a, an affirmative presidential power, it is political in that it affects the balance of power between the two branches. The, 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 the interpretation that you urge is one that, first of all, has not really been accepted in, in this court's previous um, interpretation of this clause. One, one and advantage of, of being here and being able to write. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct, Your Honor. Um, however, we would urge that this court interpret the Constitution uh, the text of the Constitution in its plain meaning, and we urge that a plain meaning of the Constitution means can be read as saying that return is prevented when the Congress is not there, and not only when the Congress is adjourned for a final adjournment. Indeed, there are a lot of, there are a lot of other considerations, for example, the, the need for prompt reconsideration that would not be taken care of if the if the interpretation that you urge but is, is given. Is there any time limit when the Congress must reconsider the bill? It can let it sit for months? Um, that is true, Your Honor. Um, there is no requirement within the, the Constitution. But we urge that the pocket veto clause was drafted as it, as, it is, as it is now to encourage Congress to reconsider um, legislation. The Constitution, as a general matter, distributes power um, to different branches. It does not give advice, but we urge that the, the structure of the clause nonetheless shows the framers' intent that Congress re re immediately reconsider legislation. Shouldn't we so interpret it in, in light of the modern reality that there are a lot of adjournments, that the adjournments are not as long-lived as the adjournments uh, of old, and thus, why sh shouldn't we interpret uh, this as uh, in a rather commonsensical fashion in light of Congress's ability to immediately come back, which obviously was not the case uh, at the time of the, of the drafting of this provision? Um, the, the numerous adjournments that Congress takes nowadays, Your Honor, will not necessarily be affected by the, whole, by the interpretation of the pocket veto clause that we urge. The only adjournment of Congress that is relevant for the purposes, for the interpretation that we urge is an adjournment that falls on the 10th day after a bill has been presented to the well, president. Well, that could happen a lot, though, could it not? Um, and, and, and it does. It's happening a lot these days. This is becoming a serious problem. But another way of looking at that, Your Honor, is to look at what Congress has to do to avoid having a bill pocket veto. 
the need only either rather than not to take adjournments. That that's uh, under your very formalistic approach to the clause. They just don't dare adjourn. Exactly, they are adjourned. But I was suggesting that rather than adjourning on the tenth day that a bill should be returned by the president, they could delay adjourning until after that period or they could delay presentment to the president until after that period. Indeed, that is what we urge, one of the key reasons why the pocket veto clause is so important, because it encourages Congress to adopt these good legislative practices that it would otherwise not adopt. For example, of rather- one thing it could do instead of adopting a legislative practice is it could adopt a name. And I've, I've asked you what you meant by prevent. Yes. What, what do you mean by adjourn? And I've, let me explain why I'm asking it this way. Yes. The Supreme Court used to have sessions in which they began the first Monday in October, and when they handed down their last decision, they adjourned. And then they might have to call a special summer session. Starting perhaps six or maybe seven years ago, this court stopped adjourning. The justices stopped hearing cases. There were no more oral arguments. There were no more decisions. Everybody scattered to vacation but there was no adjournment. Could Congress do that very same thing? They just stop meeting without adjourning. It sounds like they satisfy your formal requirements. I do believe that there are requirements in the Constitution that, that govern how Congress may or may not adjourn. Um, for example, the famous, uh, there's the three-day adjournment that a House of Congress can take without the leave of the other House, and then there's the procedure for adjournment um, by a joint resolution. Right, but, but, but the question I'm asking is yeah. whether they have to adjourn in order to stop meeting. Is it possible for them to say, we are not adjourning, but everybody go home for them to have no sessions? Well, so that, that at the end of the session, instead of announcing, instead of the Speaker of the House announcing, we now are adjourned sine die, they just say, we don't plan to have any more meetings for a while. <laughs> Well, then we would urge that this court not adopt a formal interpretation of the Constitution. But in fact, since all of the but same you've been concerns- you a plain meaning formalist argument to us. It's a little late to say, don't make a plain meaning argument. Well, I didn't, I wasn't contradicting what I had said before. I was saying that that would clearly be a case where we would exalt form far beyond the realm of substance to hold that because Congress just said they had an adjourned. The fact that these same considerations all exist. Well, do you think that this court is doing something wrong and not adjourning at the end of its decisions? The first Monday in October these days, this court says October term 1989 is now adjourned. October term 1990 is convened. They follow just like that. Yes. Right? And Congress could do the same thing. But um, again, Your Honor, I believe that this court has more flexibility, so to speak, to decide what it does or does not do than does the Congress of the United States. And again, this court's adjournment does not so directly affect the functioning of another branch of government as does, in fact, the adjournment of the Congress in this case. There's an intricate system set up between the President and Congress for return and objection to bills and so on and so forth and for Congress to decide unilaterally that it would define adjournment to suit its own purposes um, would seem far more problematic than when this court decides to do that. Um, to briefly touch upon my third point, I see I've practically run out of time, but you what I would have stressed. <laughs> uh, Give you one sentence. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> case, I would have stressed in my third point <laughs> that <laughs> that um, the interpretation urged by the respondents would interject um, undesirable uncertainty into the, the, the legislative process because this court would have, this court and other federal courts would have to determine on a case-by-case -case basis what constitutes return when a house is not in session. This is um, something that would, would make this court such a vigorous participant in the legislative process that it could not have been um, an interpretation of the pocket veto clause that the framers would have espoused. Um, That's to conclude, one sentence. <laughs> okay. So to conclude, for all the above reasons, we urge this court to reverse the judgment of the Court of Appeals. I thank the court. Thank right, we'll hear from the other side. You may proceed. 
Chief Justice Hall, and may it please the court. This case presents two questions. First, whether the would Congress- you, Would you tell us who you are? I'm sorry, Your Honor. I was going to get to that after the questions, but <laughs> I'll do it right now. My name is Cynthia Monaco, and I will address the question of standing. And my colleague, Michael Best, will address the question of return to constitutionally congressionally appointed agents. Thank you. Returning to the questions. <laughs> the first question is whether the Congress of the United States may, as a body, seek judicial redress when its constitutional lawmaking power is nullified by officials who refuse to publish validly enacted laws. And the second question is whether H.R. 4042 became a law when the President neither signed nor returned it to the clerk designated to, re to receive such messages. I will return only briefly to the facts. This case arises from the failure of executive branch officials to publish H.R. 4042. H.R. 4042 was passed by voice vote and sent to the President, who had earlier indicated that he had no objections to its passage. But despite his assurances, the President did not sign the bill. And despite his established practice of sending messages, including veto messages, to the Clerk of the House during adjournments, the President did not return H.R. 4042. He instead announced his intention to pocket veto the bill on the 10th day after it had been presented to him. In accordance with his announcement, H.R. 4042 was not published. 33 members of the House brought this suit, in which the House bipartisan leadership, the Speaker of the House, and the Senate all immediately intervened. And this case comes as an appeal by the petitioners from the 1984 decision of the D.C. Circuit, declaring H.R. 4042 a validly enacted law and ordering its publication. Article III standing requires that a plaintiff allege injury fairly traceable to the actions of the defendant and likely to be redressed by the requested relief. Well, here, Congress is alleging the most distinct and palpable injury it can suffer, the nullification of its constitutional prerogative to make laws. Ever since this court's decision in Coleman v. Miller, this and other courts have recognized that legislators have a plain and direct interest in maintaining the effectiveness of their votes. And let me ask you, are you taking the position that the individual members of Congress have standing, or are you taking the position solely that Congress as a body has we're standing? Ta we're taking a position, Your Honor, that we do not need to reach the question of whether individual congressmen have standing, because as petitioners concede, Congress as a body is here. Both houses of Congress are represented, and Congress has asserted its interest in this case. And, and thank you for pointing that out, because we do go one step beyond Coleman v. Miller, in that we do not have to decide whether the individual legislatures have standing. That was my point in raising that. And petitioners, in fact, can point to no case, and they do not point to any case in which maintaining the effectiveness of a vote or the nullification of a vote by a legislature was not held to be injury in fact for standing purposes. Do you think we should be satisfied with the House of Representatives being here represented by uh, its leadership when there has not? And I know it's consistent with the rules of, of the House and we should respect those rules, but well, there was never a House vote on participating in this, so it's slightly odd to say that we have the full Congress here. Well, in fact, Your Honor, the Senate is intervening pursuant to um, 2 U.S.C. Section 288E, which allows it to intervene on behalf of Congress. Now, both houses of Congress passed that statute, and the fact that the House bipartisan leadership and the Speaker of the House is here indicates that Congress's interests, or the House's interests, are, are equally represented. And you think that should suffice? I, I mean, think that I, should suffice, Your uh, Honor. Doesn't that create a little bit of tension with Chada and our emphasis on Congress acting bicamerally? And particularly if you're willing to say that we will set aside the interests of individual legislators and you now have Congress as a body, and yet we have no bicameral act of Congress with respect to participating in this particular litigation. Well, Your Honor, um, we would suggest, first of all, that the fact that the Senate is intervening pursuant to a statute which allows it to intervene on behalf of Congress, not merely the Senate, that in fact both houses are represented, notwithstanding the intervention of the Speaker in the House bipartisan leadership, which are the same Speaker in the House bipartisan leadership as they were in 1983. But beyond that, 
um, even if this court is not satisfied that the House is represented here, the Senate is certainly represented as a body because they have invoked this statute and they're, they're here as the Senate. And the Senate is certainly adequate to um, invoke the power of Congress to bring this suit. Both houses have specific rights which are conferred on them by the Constitution, and there's nothing in any case suggesting that the House and the Senate have to agree um, that their constitutional lawmaking power was nullified. Failure to recognize, in this case, uh, the nullification of Congress's lawmaking power will permanently preclude Congress from ever asserting an injury. I'm, I'm not sure, counsel, that I understand how Congress's lawmaking power has been precluded. I mean, what, what is it that Congress has been prevented from doing? Congress has been prevented from having the law it passed, H.R. 4042, treated as a law, Your Honor. But of course, a return veto does that, too. I mean, what, what this is about is the difference, I assume, between a pocket and a return veto. If the President made a return veto, yes, Your Honor. the bill would not have become a law. That's right. Right. But Congress so then the, would have. Is, what, how is Congress prevented compared to the return veto? That seems to me is the question. Because were there a return veto, Congress would, consistent with the provisions in the Constitution, be permitted to take another vote and to decide whether they were going to override the President's veto. And why can't they do that with a pocket veto? Because, Your Honor, first of all, the bill sits in the executive clerk's office, and the Constitution. Well, presumably the text is available in Congress. <laughs> they didn't. They haven't forgotten what's in it. They've got it, right? Yes, Your Honor. All right. And now why don't they vote on it? Even if that were, that were not a barrier, as Your Honor is suggesting. Well, I can't see the barrier. They've got it. They, they could, is Your Honor suggesting they could reintroduce a second piece or no, resurrect my, my, the text? Or? No, I, let me tell you what seems to me an available procedural route. Yes, Your Honor. Make reenacting a bill that has been pocket vetoed a privileged matter, like a point of personal privilege, or for that matter, mm -hmm. like voting on a return veto. It can be called up and passed and ruled on without debate. I right. see. See, what your brief depicts this as a case where, gee, they have to start over. It has to be reintroduced, has to go to a subcommittee, right? It goes through all of those things. It would, in fact, But, but that seems with the to rules. me to be Congress's choice. Congress, if it wishes, can make reenacting a bill that's been pocket vetoed privileged. And in that event, it would be treated just like a return veto. Let now that, right, you see, that's, that's how I set this question up, is since Congress can do that if it wants, what's, where's the real difference? Because, Your Honor, Congress could do a great many things. And as petitioners suggest... But you tell us Congress is the plaintiff, so we have to... Exactly, We Your have Honor. to view what Congress could do to protect itself. No, no, Your Honor, if, if you let me finish. Congress could do a great many things. Congress could reintroduce and repass a subsequent piece of legislation which looks like this. Congress could even call it H.R. 4042 if it wanted to. But the Constitution only requires the Congress to pass legislation once. And Congress did, no, in this case. Well, that's just simply not true. I'm trying to How figure so, out Your what Honor? the difference is between a pocket veto and a return veto. If the President makes a return veto, Congress is going to have to take it up and vote on it again. That is true, Your Honor. So how is, how is the vote on it again after a pocket veto different from voting on it again after a return veto? Well, what Your Honor is suggesting is that Congress has the text somewhere, and regardless of the fact that the actual bill has not been returned as the Constitution requires, it could go get a copy of the bill, bring this up, and tell the Congress, well, we think this should have been returned, so we'll just vote on it as though it had been returned. And in fact, your brief points out that Congress did just that with one of, Bush's, with one of President Bush's vetoes. It's at page 39 of your brief, and it says this demonstrates that Congress can do it. Well, I, I then have this question. If, if you tell us Congress can do it. Your Honor, Your Honor, this is, this is the central point of this case. And, mm. and Congress, <laughs> and that is that Congress can do a great many things, and Congress could waive its rules and do a great many things, many of them which would give rise to the President's initiating an action saying, no, I pocket vetoed that bill. But what Congress has chosen to do here, Your Honor, is to assert that its constitutional lawmaking power was nullified and to seek redress from this court. Anything Congress could do to circumvent what the President has done would not redress the injury. And certainly, Your Honor, Congress is a political body. 
And Congress may not choose even to assert such an injury for political reasons. But Congress has chosen to do so here. It comes before this court but, saying. But then, then you're in the position of saying, Congress, for political reasons, has neglected what seems to be a perfectly good self-help remedy. And therefore, we wish the help of the courts. That does seem to make it that you're asking for something that you do not need and which doesn't seem to be necessary to redress the injury, is it? Yes, it, it is, it, Your it, Honor. It looks, I mean, I, as I said to your opponents, it looks like the two halves of their argument conflict. It does seem to me that the two halves of your argument have the same and opposite conflict. What Your Honor would like is for Congress to say, yes, we could make this case go away mm. by agreeing that we could do something which could get us what we wanted in H.R. 4042. And sometimes the highest duty of court is to <laughs> cases go away. No, Your Honor. I, I would disagree. I think the highest duty of this court is to adjudicate a constitutional impasse between the two branches. Now, as Justice Powell asserted in Gold, his concurrence in Goldwater v. Carter, when the two branches, the President and the Congress, have asserted as bodies their interest in having a matter adjudicated, it should then be adjudicated. And the fact that Congress could pass a subsequent piece of legislation or could suspend its rules does not redress the injury in this case, which is that Congress did what it was constitutionally required to do to pass H.R. 4042, and it, officials of the executive branch refused to treat that passage as a law. That, Your Honor, is injury. And if Congress wishes to come to this court and say, please redress this injury, it is a very dangerous proposition to say, no, you could possibly, if you formed the political alliances necessary and did what was required, get around this case. It would not have redressed the injury. And, and that is what is being asserted here, an injury. And let me point out that if we do not hear this case, excuse me, if this court does not hear this case, does not recognize this as an injury, then it is not an injury no matter how many bills the president orders the archivist not to publish. And no matter what type of unconstitutional deprivation of constitutional prerogatives goes on between the two branches. And that is what is at stake here. Just because this is one bill does not make the injury any less. To what extent should it inform our judgment that Congress over the many decades of our history has not seen fit until very recently to avail itself of the courts? And, and thus you're, you're bringing to the courts the kind of dispute that frankly we're, we're unaccustomed to and thus we're a bit uncomfortable with. Not at all, Your Honor. I would suggest that the fact that the Congress has never done this before indicates how rare this case is. And in fact, what the injury which is at stake is the type of injury which will not often be alleged. It, let me point out at this point what Congress is not asking this court to recognize, since the petitioners raise the fear that Congress will continually come back to court after this. Congress is not asking this court to recognize that it has an injury if the executive merely refuses to enforce the laws, because Congress does not have a constitutional prerogative in enforcement that is clearly within the discretion of the executive. And Congress is not injured. In fact, it is nothing more than embarrassed if this or another court strikes down one of its laws as unconstitutional. It is, it is within the power of this court to do so. But Congress is distinctly and palpably injured when the laws it makes are not treated as laws. Could, could you explain further the difference you see there? And suppose Congress passes something, call it the Robinson-Patman Act. Yes, Your Honor. And the executive branch says, that's a stupid piece of legislation. We are not going to bring any Robinson-Patman prosecutions. In fact, the executive branch has said that. And there it it no has said that on many occasions with many pieces right. of legislation which Congress has passed. And Congress now, should not what, be allowed to sue them. What is the difference you see for purposes of standing between the archivist not promulgating the law mm -hmm. and officially putting it in the statutes at large but making it clear it will have no effect? In the latter situation, or whichever, the former or the latter situation, the one where the archivist does not publish the laws, Your Honor, the laws are given no legal force as Congress has indicated in a specific statute and which this court has recognized. Laws are not laws until they are publicly declared to be laws and made known to the people who are to be bound by them. But this sounds like a highly formal theory. Your answer to my last question was the problem was the piece of paper hadn't been sent back. And now it's that it's not, not on the statutes at large. And it, but isn't what's really important about lawmaking not who holds a slip of paper, 
but whether laws are carried out. That is you important. You seem to be saying it doesn't matter whether the laws are carried out. We're suing to see that it's printed in a buckram volume. Your Honor, I'm not meaning to suggest that it doesn't matter in a moral sense that the President stops enforcing the laws. I think that would be wrong. What I'm saying is that the Congress should not be allowed to come to court and assert that but, as an injury. But the question I'm asking is what is, what is the thing of which Congress has and of which it has been deprived? It has I can understand the argument that the thing Congress has is the power to make rules which are respected. But you seem now to have reduced it to the claim that the thing that is really the central core of Congress's power is to have something produced in a buckram volume. No, Your Honor. That, that is not what I'm reducing this to. Let me, let me try and rephrase this. The narrowest injury Congress can suffer, the most distinct injury Congress can suffer, is that its power to make laws, which is what we all think of Congress as existing for, and what we elect members of Congress to do, is denied them. That is an entirely different injury or grievance from when Congress makes a law and the executive within his discretion decides for whatever reason, they may be good reasons, they may be invalid reasons, that he does not wish to enforce them. Congress's interest in a law should stop once it is publicly declared to be a law. And the fact is, that point has been chosen as publication in the statutes at large. Well, where it's somewhere else, that's where Sorry. it comes. As a practical matter, yes, though, the right. Senate comes in uh, to court when, when the President says, look, I'll sign this law because it's a large appropriation bill, but there's one provision in there that's unconstitutional, and I don't intend to enforce that one constitution. The Senate at that point comes in and says we're injured. The Senate should not be allowed to assert that injury, Your Honor, because enforcement is within the discretion of the President. Now, a private plaintiff somewhere might be able to find but an injury the there, but Congress it can't. The President's discretion it says the President shall faithfully enforce the laws. That, that is right, Your Honor. But he decides where to apply the resources to enforce those laws. And as I'm suggesting, if Congress were aggrieved because the President were not enforcing laws it's passed, its grievance would be no different from the grievance of any other citizen, perhaps including Your Honor or myself, that the President were not carrying out his duty to enforce the laws. That is the distinction. Your Honor has pointed to it. Well, how about the Senate coming in in the Chada case? And the government says, uh, we think it's unconstitutional and nobody's going to defend it, and the Senate comes in and says, we'll defend it. And in fact, this Court allowed the Senate to defend the constitutionality of a statute because nobody else would. But the Senate was not assuming that it had an injury in that case. And we would not hold that the Senate or the House should be allowed to assert a constitutional injury just because one of their laws was being challenged. Now, whether or not they could in their capacity intervene to defend the constitutionality of the law is a very different issue from whether or not the Senate or the House could come to this court and say, you know, we really like this law. Please, en please enforce it and please uphold it as constitutional. I would like to quickly point out um, the redressability aspect of this case. We'll give you uh, one sentence. One <laughs> One sentence, you Your Honor. You can use the same sentence that Ms. Weeks used. <laughs> <laughs> Actions in which legislators have brought a suit have only been held to be non-justiciable in two general grounds. The first is when Congress itself promulgated a statute which gave a grievance to individual legislators, and the second is when the Congress as a body had not yet asserted that injury. That is not the case here, Your Honor. The Congress is asserting that it has been injured by no action of its own, and the Congress itself is seeking this court to redress that injury by giving effect to its laws as laws. And so we urge this court to allow the Congress to assert this, the most distinct injury it can suffer, and to decide whether its lawmaking power was nullified on the merits. Thank you. Chief Justice Hall, and may it please the court. This case is about whether Congress, I by its- I also need to know who you are. Oh, my, my name is Michael Best, Your Honor. I will be uh, representing the respondents on the merits of this case. Thank you. This case is about whether Congress, by its adjournment, prevented the return of H.R. 4042. Congress did not prevent 
but facilitated the return of HR 4042 by appointing an agent to receive veto messages during its adjournment. The president knew of this procedure, but he chose not to return the bill. Therefore, under the presentment clause of the Constitution, the, pill, the bill became law 10 days after it was presented to him. The plan of the Constitution is to give the president a qualified veto over legislation passed by Congress and to allow the Congress to reconsider and override that veto if there are the requisite votes. The presentment clause sets up two mechanisms to protect that basic structure. First, there is a 10-day limit on the president's consideration of bills. This time limit is necessary because it would, otherwise the president could defeat Congress's ability to reconsider his veto. If he could hold on to a bill indefinitely, he could effectively turn his qualified veto into an absolute one by refusing to return the bill. And thus, he would, not, he would neither have signed nor vetoed the bill, and the Congress would have no opportunity to reconsider it. Thus, it would never become law. He would effectively have an absolute veto. If this time limit stood alone, however, Congress could effectively defeat the President's veto power by adjourning and leaving him no way to return the bill. There, um, after 10 days, the President would neither have signed nor returned it because he would have been unable to return it with his veto. But the bill would become law because of the 10-day limit on his, reconsidera on his consideration of a bill. Therefore, the Constitution provides that to prevent this, to prevent Congress from avoiding a presidential veto in this way, that if the Congress uh, uh, prevents the president from returning it, the bill does not become law. This is the pocket veto clause, or what it's come to be, it's come to be called the pocket veto clause. It serves only the defensive purpose of protecting the president's qualified veto, that is, his ability to consider legislation for 10 days and to return a bill with his objections if he so desires. I'm not sure I understand how, what, on your view, pocket veto clause is there for. You say it protects his power to make a return veto. Yes, Your Honor. But you also say that there can be an agent, and presumably instead of an agent, there could be a mail drop. So on your view, the president could always write something, say, I'm vetoing this bill, and drop it in the mail. Uh, not? No, Your Honor, I, I, that is not our argument. We do not argue that the president could, could do anything. Be, well, beyond I, I know that's not your argument technically, but the question I'm asking is, is, given your theory, why is there ever a pocket veto? Because the president could always make a return veto and drop it in the mail. Well, because... There, there are some, there are concern there, there are some concerns which um, we do not dispute to be valid that the court has discussed in in considering the pocket veto clause, and those are the concerns that led it in dicta in the pocket veto case to suggest that perhaps an agent might never be permissible. Those are un, those are concerns of uncertainty. Uh, the pocket veto case court said that they, that um, an agent might be impermissible because if a bill were returned to an agent who could make no record of when it was returned, there would be no way for the, there would be no way to find out whether or not, in fact, the bill had been validly returned. So there would be no way to know whether the bill became law oh, or not. I, and I, I, I don't understand that. The president makes a return veto. He drops it in the mail. No one, no one may be there in Congress to open it for the next six months, but you tell us that the clerk doesn't open it either, but seals it. The president, meanwhile, publishes his return veto in the compilation of presidential documents doesn't send the bill on to the archivist. So it's obviously not a law. Where's the uncertainty? Well, the uncertainty is whether or not the, the, the president has actually returned the bill to the Congress. What the, what the uh, clerk of the House can do, and in fact, in this case and every other case in which a return veto has been effectively made through an agent, is to uh, record when the bill comes in. So that if Congress wants to find right, out. He sends it certified mail return receipt requested. Well, there's no, there's no one authorized to. Uh, to, to get the receipt, Your Honor, so it would be impossible for anyone to find out whether or not the so bill had arrived. So they refused delivery, and the Postal Service says delivery refused January 16th, 1991? Well, the, the Constitution does require that the bill be returned, Your Honor, and the bill would not then be returned. And if, uh, what, what the... No, what, no wait, are, are you suggesting that if they're in session and the President makes a real return veto, it won't be effective if the Speaker of the House tells the clerk, no, you know, avoid service of process, avoid <laughs> service of the bill, just arrange to have a long lunch hour today. No, no, no Your Honor, I'm not suggesting that. Uh, I, what, I, what I am suggesting is that the, the rationale behind the pocket veto clause is, 
is to protect the president's ability to return a bill. If, he, if he, there's no one there authorized to return it, then he simply can't return it on a commonsensical reading of what the word return means. He, he can't return it to anyone. There's no one there. However, if, if he can return the bill, if there's someone there to return it, then his veto can be perfectly effective. I, I just don't understand that. You mean no one at the Capitol receives mail between the end of the 101st Congress and the beginning of the 102nd? Well, well there's just honor. nobody there? Well, Your Honor, you're, I, I think actually that you may be pointing out exactly the uncertainty problem that would arise. Certainly someone appoints mail, but in order for the president to know whether or not the, he, can, he can return the bill, he has to know whether or not uh, there's someone there to receive it. He doesn't know who it is in the situation that Your Honor posits, and there's simply no way for him to be sure that he can return the bill. Mr. Best, isn't the real concern of the clause that there be a, an orderly and continual process that eventuates in legislation that, that's binding on the people? It's, yes, Your I know Honor. We, we, we spoke of confusion and how do we know who got the message and all that. Yes, Your Honor. But isn't the real value, and, and your interpretation seems to me to, to rob this, this value of some of its efficacy, is to make sure that the process of legislation is a process of dialogue between the President and the Congress. Yes, Your Honor. And, and, that, and our interpretation does not defeat that in any well, way. Well, now, wh why not? It, it seems well, to me that it, it, it does. It defeats it to the extent that Congress can leave, leaving the president with inadequate opportunity to review the legislation. By the time he does, then Congress is no longer there to continue the dialogue. Well, Your Honor, the, the, to begin with, the, the president has his full 10 days to consider the legislation, whether Congress is in session or whether it's out of session and has appointed an agent. So to the the beginning step of this process, that the, that the President be allowed 10 days to consider it, is fully protected by, by our interpretation and by the procedure established by the Congress. Secondly, the, the dialogue that Your Honor refers to is that the Congress shall have the President's objections. The President's role in, in the presentment clause is to return a bill with his objections to the Congress so that the Congress may reconsider those objections. In, in our scheme, in the scheme that we propose that the Court adopt, there is no way, there, there, Excuse me, the, um, the Congress is still able to do that. The President may return his objections with the bill, and when they return, the bill may be reconsidered and the President's uh, objections well, That's right, e eventually, but the dialogue has really stopped, and here the dialogue stopped for 67 days. And it yes, seems to right. me that the structure of the clause suggests that that delay was very important to the framers. Well, Your Honor, I don't think actually that the, that the that the structure of the clause suggests that. I think if, if in fact that were true, if the framers intended that the presentment clause required Congress to reconsider a bill immediately as petitioners propose, then it would have built in a time limit on Congress's reconsideration. That would be the most that. powerful demonstration, but not the only one. The, the uh, section does say that upon the return that the Congress, the House, shall proceed to reconsider it Yes, and we know from historical practice that Congress does, if it's in session, very promptly turn to the vetoed bill, which is exactly what the framers thought. Well, that's not actually, uh, that, that doesn't entirely comport with history, Your Honor, if I may. The, the fact is that sometimes Congress does that. Often it does. But often, as we point out in our brief, Congress delays for considerable periods of time. And there's nothing in the Constitution to prevent Congress from doing that. If Congress decides, as it did in 1985, that uh, it, when, a return, when a bill has been vetoed by the president, it wishes to postpone reconsideration for eight months, as it did once in 1985 with a veto by President Reagan, there's nothing in the Constitution to prevent it from doing Quite so. Quite right, but it's customary practice is to the contrary. Well, much of the time, Your Honor, but all that, all that our, all that our interpretation of the clause does is it allows Congress to make that decision in advance. There's no practical difference between Congress at the end of a session, as the situation I pointed out in 1985 did, uh, that is to say that at the end of the, se the first session when they received a bill, they were going to postpone consideration until the next session, and saying that when they adjourn, they're going to uh, give effect to the president's veto by allow the president to have an effective veto by appointing an agent, and they will de they've decided that they're going to want to reconsider that if the president decides to veto it at the beginning of the next session. There's simply no practical difference between it, and the court shouldn't adopt an interpretation that doesn't comport with the reality of that. Now, 
the, the per as I've tried to point out, the purpose of the pocket veto clause was as a defensive mechanism to protect the president's veto. The president should really only complain if his veto has been made ineffective. Um, the court in, this court has said that the presentment clause should be interpreted to protect the president's veto and the Congress's veto, uh, and the Congress's ability to override that veto, excuse me. Uh, petitioners would have the court defeat Congress's ability to override a veto when, it, when Congress has not prevented the president from returning it or has made his veto ineffective, but in fact has protected the president's veto by appointing an agent so that the president can veto the bill. And, and practice shows that, in fact, this is an effective way for presidents to veto bills. President Reagan himself did it seven times with House bills alone during adjournments of the Congress. And Presidents Ford and Reagan both did it before, Ford and Carter, excuse me, did, both did it before President Reagan. The, the only question then would be whether or not it's constitutionally permissible for a for return to an agent to be made. If the practical effects are such that the veto is effective, then the question is whether constitutionally the veto is effective. And this court held in Wright versus United States that a veto is effective if returned to an agent. Uh, pe petitioners try to, uh, to uh, petitioners claim that this case is not applicable because it, it, because of a three, it was only a three-day recess um, by one house. But that's not really the issue in this case. The issue in this case is really whether or not the president's veto has been protected by the mechanism established by Congress. But that's, that's true, of course, only if we take your view that preventing the return refers wholly to a political prevention, rather re wholly to a physical prevention, rather than a political one. Now, Justice Starr suggested, as I had raised with your adversary, that this might have a political meaning rather than a physical one. Does, does your, is it correct to say that your argument hinges on con convincing us that preventing its return is wholly a reference to the physical possibility of making the return? Well, uh, well, Your Honor, yes, it does, to the extent that, to the extent that, um, Well, then, if, once you say yes to that, the question is, I, <laughs> What difference does it make whether there is an agent appointed or not, given that there's always a mail drop? Well, perhaps I should add a caveat to my answer, Your Honor. <laughs> and that would be... I assume you wish to prevail. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that would be that it does refer to physically prevent, but it, but it takes in a, a notion of a... Uh, it takes in the, the notion that the president must know whether or not, pre, whether or not he can return the bill, who he can, who he can return the bill to, and whether or not measures have been taken to make sure that, that return is known to everyone, that the, that the president's return of a bill is, is an effective one. You, I think you really give me trouble there, because as soon as you start emphasizing knowing who they can return it to and the certainty aspect, what you imply is that if the designated agent, the clerk, is out of town on the 10th on the day, then the president really can't return it, or you have to know where he is. But is it really the case that when the president makes a, sends a message to this designated agent, that he is tracked down personally, climbing Mount McKinley or wherever he is, or is it simply delivered to some institution? When, it, when the bill is presented to the president, or when Suppose on the 10th day, on this very day, the clerk, the designated agent, Yes, Your Honor. was on a vacation. He was hiking someplace. Well, Your Honor, the... It would be delivered to his secretary or somebody else, I assume? Well, um, presumably as to whoever was acting as clerk of the House that day. And certainly, Your Honor, um, the, there is a hypothetical po possibility as petitioners raised that perhaps the, the uh, clerk might be out of the office. But the fact is that that's never... that 20 years of experience with this has shown that there, has, that there is no problem in that respect. But of and course, that may cut against you by showing there's no problem whether somebody is designated as an agent or not. There's always somebody home at Congress. Well, to an, to an extent, yes, Your Honor. But the, con the Congress... Well, if, once you say yes, aren't you then forced to the proposition that the pocket veto cases are wrong? Now, we're, we're perfectly willing to entertain the possibility that our decisions are wrong. But it sounds like what you want to say is that the pocket veto can't be used except at the end of a session of Congress. And all interior spaces are required for return vetoes. That would be a possible political theory of the clause. 
but it seems to be inconsistent with your physical theory. But your logic suggests a political theory. Well, our, lo our logic is a, a political theory, Your Honor, but I think the physical theory of it ties into that. If Cong if the, what, what I'm trying to say is that the court is, is that the court's decision in the pocket veto case was that where there's no one, where the, there's no, where there's an uncertain process by which the president would have to return the bill, then there might be concerns about whether or not the bill actually has been returned. And in, in the situation in this case, where an agent has been authorized, there are not those, those uh, uncertainty concerns. That the fact is that, that, um, the, that phys physical return does take in a common sense notion that there, that there be some way to return, that there actually be some way to return the bill that the president can know of and that will not give rise to, the da to um, questions about whether or not the bill actually has been seasonably returned. But the fact is that the, in the situations posited your honor, I, by your honor, I believe that, for instance, returning the bill by mail, if it were simply to be delivered there's, and there's no authorized person to stamp the bill when it comes in and to, uh, to explain to Congress the day that it came in, as they do now so that it can be entered on the record, then the uncertainty concerns will or may arise. Whereas here, there simply are not any uncertainty concerns. And the fact is that the Congress has, uh, has found a way to facilitate its growing calendar as well as and still protect the president's veto. The fact is that the clause was not meant to give an affirmative power to the president. There's nothing in the Federalist Papers or any of the convention debates which suggests that the, that the pocket veto clause was meant to give the president some power. There's no differentiation between an absolute veto and a return veto or a pocket veto and a return veto. The president's veto is meant to be qualified and the, and the pocket veto clause is meant to protect that. Congress here has protected that. I see that my time is up. And I would, I would urge the court to affirm the decision of the circuit court. Um, the 98th Congress's adjournment did not prevent the president from returning H.R. 4042, and this court should so hold. Thank you. Thank you. We'll hear a rebuttal. Just a very brief um, statement, and only on the pocket veto issue. We agree with much of what our um, distinguished court counsel um, has said about the pocket veto clause. However, he still, the, the respondents have still failed to explain, first of all, why the pocket veto clause is absolute, because many of the, the explanations they gave for why it exists, for example, to protect the president's right to 10 days, to protect his right to use his return veto, those are all purposes that could have been served by a, a qualified provision. Indeed, the qualified provision that the framers rejected before they accepted the pocket veto clause did all of those things because it, re it required the president to return a bill on the first day of the next meeting of the legislature. And that would have taken care of all of the concerns here. Nonetheless, the framers rejected that clause and accepted the absolute pocket veto. We urged that there was a reason why the framers did that. And the second very brief point we wish to make is that there is no principled way in which this court can distinguish between return to a house or return to an agent or other sorts of return. The Constitution either requires return to a house in session or it does not. Um, the agent, for example, the opposing counsel suggests is, a, is some sort of a middle ground between um, a house in session and using the mail, for example. But we urge that once this court holds that an agent can receive bills, it necessarily holds that all other um, means of return which Congress may propose as opposed to return to a house in session would also be at least facially permissible. And then this court would have to decide if in fact those means of return met the constitutional mandate and we would have all of the uncertainty concerns that we tried to raise the first time. I thank the court. All right, we will um, take a recess. All right. Let's do the matter.
Everybody up. Um, please, please return to your seats. Attention. The justices will be returning shortly um, to deliver their decision as to best brief, best oralist, and best team overall. Um, the BSA would like to congratulate both teams on their excellent performance and on their commitment. <laughs> on the work they've done throughout the competition. And uh, once again, we'd like to remind everyone that there's a reception um, at the John Chipman Gray Room, in the second floor of Pound Hall, immediately following these arguments. And um, those in the video overflow rooms are also invited. Thank you. <laughs> have the honor of being able to announce the winners of this year's Ames Moot Court Finals. The panel has determined that the best oralist is Cynthia Monaco. not just because I prevailed on my brethren to honor another Cynthia. <laughs> the best brief we have determined is the respondent's brief. And we have determined that the best team is the respondent's team. I would like very much to compliment both sides in this argument. I wish that I could tell you that the usual argument in the Ninth Circuit was anywhere near the quality of this argument tonight. It's been outstanding on both sides and a pleasure to, to judge and to hear. And uh, I now want to turn over to, uh, oh, I guess Judge Easterbrook is our next most senior. Justice Easterbrook. I have, to, I have to interrupt for one story. <laughs> um, in the state of California, the Supreme Court has justices on it. In the Ninth Circuit, we have judges. And of course, counsel coming in California from one court to another will frequently come in and say, Justice, and name some judge in the Ninth Circuit. And so we tell them, there is no justice in the Ninth Circuit. <laughs> Judge Easterbrook. You can all be assured there's no justice in the Seventh either. <laughs> I want to second Judge Hall's compliment of the teams. When I was a law student, I used to go to the moot courts. And I would watch, and afterwards the panel would come back and make its comments, and that every year when I was a law student, the panel would say, you know, this was really wonderfully done. 
you're so much better than the lawyers who actually come into our court. <laughs> and I, I concluded that this was some kind of verbal formula by which people were being made to feel good. Uh, that it couldn't obviously be true because the people who were doing this were second and third year law students. How were they going to beat the real advocates who, who had worked on this case for a long time? Well, then I left law school. I went and became a law clerk. And I looked at these advocates, and I compared them with people in the moot court. And it began to dawn on me that those judges were telling the truth. <laughs> and now I'm, I've been on the receiving end of these arguments for many years. And it's perfectly clear those judges were telling the truth. <laughs> that one, one should not take what Judge Hall just said with a grain of salt. It is absolutely the case that these were absolutely wonderful performances. Uh, by the standards of the legal profession, and all four of you and all 12 members of the teams have every reason to feel quite proud. One, there are two, two things that I think are very hard for lawyers to do, which were done well in this case. One is that I think the, the greatest skill of an appellate advocate is seizing the case and making, putting upon it your own affirmative argument. It's so easy when a case has come through lower courts to become a counterpuncher. The appellant counterpunches the opinion of the Court of Appeals. Then the appellee or the respondent counterpunches the brief of the appellant, and you begin to lose the thread for what is it that is underlying this case and why is it that a particular outcome is appropriate. I think the advocates here were very careful about that and never lost sight of the fact that their obligation, and indeed their the best way to succeed, and the greatest service they can do the court is to explain how they see the structure of the Constitution and what it is that is really going on to make an affirmative case. That was done very well, and I was happy to see it. The second thing that is hardest about oral argument, as distinct from the briefs, and what makes oral argument really an art form, not a science, it's an art, is dealing with things the court throws you that you don't expect. An oral argument is never a monologue. The brief is the monologue. When the time comes for the oral argument, it's a discussion with the court. The discussion has opportunities. It has surprises. And the best oral advocates are those who, in response to the opportunities and surprises, can reshape their argument. I mean, sometimes I say that the best oral arguments are those in which you have a sense of sitting down with the advocate and having a discussion in which both people are taking account of what the other says. It's not that the questions are a distraction or something out of the flow or there's something to be disposed of before I can get back. They are the window into the mind of the court. And I was happy that all four of the oralists today accepted arguments in that spirit, accepted questions from the bench as an opportunity to understand what was troubling the judges, to reshape, to respond, uh, to participate in this process of dialogue that oral advocacy can be. Uh, and I am, I am pleased to have seen it all, and I congratulate you. Well, let me join as well in congratulating the uh, winners, but uh, in, in all honesty, to have achieved this accomplishment of being here this evening and to do as, as wonderfully as uh, Stephen and Rhoda did, as both teams uh, did, uh, is a great tribute to you and I know a source of great pleasure to loved ones, family members who are here, uh, important uh, others and, and the like. This has, uh, I think, been a wonderful display of uh, advocacy skills. And I would make uh, a few very brief points. One is that the vision of oral argument should, in fact, be that of an exchange. Last term, uh, Justice Kennedy uh, said in an interview that too many advocates coming into the Supreme Court, and I would like to think that he wasn't thinking of persons in the office of the Solicitor General, viewed this as an opportunity to engage in pyrotechnics and decline to engage in what Judge Easterbrook has uh, aptly called uh, dialogue. He described it as being more in the mode of a defense of a, of a doctoral dissertation. 
And one of the wonderful things said about one great judge and, and great advocate, uh, the late Henry Friendly, was that when he was at the bar practicing, and he was a fabulous oral advocate, it is said, that he gave the sense to the court that he was in a condition of respectful equality, that he had entered into a conference with the court, not seeking to usurp the court's role, but to be an advisor and counsel to the court. That will come with uh, years of experience, but I think we had four advocates here this evening who were being off counsel to the court and assisting the court in what is obviously a very important case in which there's not an enormous amount of law and one dealing with first principles. One very specific, specific observation I would make is that these are, of course, the days, as, as everyone in this room knows, of uh, crowded dockets, and I think it's a great frustration for both advocates and judges to uh, have to wrestle with the enormous caseload with the limited amount of time that's allocated for oral argument. Once upon a time, nine days were devoted to great cases like McCulloch against Maryland. Now we're down to 30 minutes to the side in the Supreme Court of the United States. One has to make <clears throat> effective use of the time. It is the court's time. And my one very specific piece of advice is don't worry once that red light goes on about making those final wind-up remarks. Just thank the court and sit down. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure for me to be here. My thanks to the dean, to Phil Berg, and the organizers of this very fine moot court.